Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Are you going to put another example exam two up? I am not putting an example exam two up, no. Okay. I think people study those too much. There was accidentally one up there, and I found it, and I yanked it, because I think people waste their time doing that. It's way better to spend the st time studying material than, I know you've heard this before, but I'll just say it again, than studying old exams. Um, I spend more time dealing with questions that I haven't talked about this term on old exams than I spend on questions that would be relevant. So it's just, it's not worth your time. The format will be exactly the same as the first exam. So the only reason I show you the first one is to give you format things, and, that, and that's basically it. Okay? Blah, blah. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. How's the studying coming along? It's a little early. Uh, studying. <laughs> studying? What are your approaches? What are you, how are you studying for this material? Note cards. Note cards. I re really recommend note cards. Writing down note cards really is a good way to go. And especially the further you get into metabolism, you're going to find note cards are really your best friend. <laughs> Putting things on note cards helps you because writing things down really helps put it in your brain. And I discovered that when I was in graduate school. I waited until I was graduate school before I discovered it, but I discovered it and it was really good. Uh, writing it down really is a very, very useful thing for you to do. Um, I haven't written the exam yet. Um, I haven't even thought about the exam yet, to be honest with you. So I'm pretty much an open mind. You guys can convince me what to put on this exam, I suppose. Um, the uh, format, as I said, will be exactly like the last exam. Uh, the point distributions may be slightly different. They vary sometimes from one exam to the next. But for the most part, the exam will be, um, uh, not for the most part, the format will be the same. Like I said, point values may change slightly. But other than that, uh, there shouldn't be any change. Content will change, of course. Um, but I do, uh, as I've said before, work from my highlights as a way of writing my exam. So look at my highlights. Look at my lectures. If I talk about it in class, it's fair game. If I don't talk about it in class, then I'm not going to ask you. And I'd, I will challenge anybody to find a, a single question on my exams where I have not talked about it in class. So I try to be very careful to do that. Um, I don't set out to trick you. I really have no intention of tricking you. My in, aim is, is in determining your level of knowledge. So I really want, really want to make sure that I do that. So, All right. So this will be like the uh, last review session. I will be available for questions and um, let you guys have at it. So what are your questions? Neil? So I was wondering, the, just to clarify, the way that it still makes a forward reaction is because there, the enzymes that precede it vary the concentrations of. OK. So uh, Neil's question has to do with the aldolase reaction. And basically, how, do, how does the cell manage to make that reaction go forward in view of the fact that it has a very, very positive delta G0 prime? So let's take a look at that reaction. Here's the reaction um, that's uh, relevant. and. Um, the delta G0 prime for this uh, reaction is something like plus 20 kilojoules per mole. And that's a very large positive en energy barrier. Um, and yet this reaction goes forwards. And I think when we think about delta G, it's always important to remember that delta G consists of two components, a constant, which is delta G0 prime, which in this case is plus 20, and a term relating, a log term relating to the concentrations of reactants and products. So um, the um, log term is the concentration of products divided by the concentration of reactants. So for delta G to be negative, there's only, and, and given the fact we have a delta G zero prime that's very positive, the only way delta G can be negative is if we have that log term be negative. For that log term to be negative, the only way that can happen is if we have small amounts of products and we have large amounts of reactants. Okay? So somebody in class said, well, those delta G0 primes of the earlier reactions help to push that. And in a sense, they do because they, they do favor making a lot more of reactant, which is this guy right here. And the reactions after this are very efficient at taking away products. So when we decrease the numerator and we increase the denominator, that makes that ratio become much smaller. 
the smaller that ratio is, the more negative that log term is. And we get it negative enough, and the reaction goes forwards. Now, I didn't get a chance to talk to you in class about the tricks that cells use to accomplish that. You're not responsible for it on this exam. You are responsible for the general nature of making that term be negative. After, uh, in fact, probably during the lecture tomorrow, I will talk actually about how that happens, but you're not responsible for it on the exam. The exam only covers through reaction 8 that I talked about. Somebody said, well, you showed reaction 9 and 10 on the screen. Are we responsible for those? The answer is no. Only the material through which I talked about and the material through which I gave you highlights about. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I hope it does. Okay, let's go home then, right? Okay. Other questions? Yes, Connie? Uh, for sugars, what type of ring structures do we need to know? Like for sugars, what type of ring structures do we need to know? So any ring structures that I told you in class you're responsible for. So you are responsible for the straight chain structures of um, glucose, fructose, ribose, galactose. You're also responsible for the ring structures of those. Specifically, you're responsible for the six-membered ring of glucose, the five-membered ring of fructose, the six-membered ring of galactose, and the five-membered ring of ribose. So we don't need to know like the furanose form of glucose? You do not need to know the furanose form of glucose, okay. nor do you need to know the pyranose form of, of fructose. OK? Yes, sir? We know sucrose. And you should also know sucrose. That's correct. Sucrose only exists in the ring form. <coughs> yes, sucrose, you're, you're right. Clarifying, you said six of the ring of galactose? Six of galactose, huh? Six. Yep. Yes, sir? Uh, investigation, um, in the first week of presentation, as it was broken down, uh, we were talking about our priority level, percent yield, and specific activity. Uh huh. Uh, that was on the last exam. That was material on the last exam. Right, right. But, but not, not It'll be on the final, but it's not, it's not comprehensive since the last. So that, that was material we covered for the last exam. Unless you want me to put it on there. No. Could you speak about uh, proto-oncogenes and oncogenes? Yes, certainly. So the, the question has to do with what are, what's the difference between proto-oncogenes and oncogenes. So, uh, the proto-oncogene is the one I always like to describe first. The proto-oncogene is a normal gene that exists in our cells, and it plays a very critical role in um, controlling cells' decisions about division, for example. And I say A, it turns out there are about several hundred of these that play very, very critical roles. Epidermal growth factor receptor, for example, is a proto-oncogene. Okay? Now, if the epidermal growth factor receptor doesn't communicate information properly, let's say it gets left in the on state where it's constantly telling the cell to divide, then that proto-oncogene is no longer functioning normally, and that proto-oncogene that does not function normally is known as an oncogene. And the reason it's known as an oncogene is the term oncogene means cancer gene. Okay. By far the most common way in which a proto-oncogene is converted into an oncogene is by mutation. So it takes mutation to convert a proto-oncogene into an oncogene, and there are hundreds of examples where that can happen. It's because there are so many oncogenes that there are so many different kinds of cancer. There's so many different ways we can screw up the system that uh, we don't have one type of cancer. We don't have one cure for cancer because there are just so many ways in which the signal or the information can be screwed up. Does that, does that help? Yes. Neil? So when you speak of um, mutation, you're, you're saying that, um, that once the um, cell manufactures a receptor, it's, it's a, a messed up receptor. Based on, because the genetic material that's made from it is mutated. So this is related to the proto-oncogene you're talking about? OK, so what I said was, if the proto-oncogene is mutated such that it's not communicating the signal properly, and the example I gave was where it was communicating a constant signal to divide, like constantly. For example, the receptor might mutate 
to the point where it is uh, always acting as if it's bound to epidermal growth factor. So if it's always in that same conformation that it would be in as if it had epidermal growth factor, then that's part of that signal that normally would tell the cell now is the time to divide. But if it's stuck in that mode, it's always telling the cell to divide. And I'm telling you that that will happen as a result of mutation. So I'm not sure if that's answering your question again, but I, but I hope that's what. Yes, sir. What causes the, in the aspartyl proteases, what causes the water to detach and act as a nucleophile? Okay, so let's go back and take a look at those, and I'll show you the aspartyl proteases. So uh, when we look at uh, metallo, there's the aspartyl proteases. Oh, it wasn't what I was looking for. The mechanism that they use uh, to do their strategy is here, okay? So his question is right here, this water, how does it become a nucleophile? And the answer is that it has to be activated just like every other nucleophile that we saw. So when I showed you the serine protease, we had that hydroxyl group hanging off of serine. The hydroxyl group of serine is not active. Only when that proton gets pulled off and we make an alkoxide ion, then it's a nucleophile and then it attacks the carbonyl group. We saw a similar thing when I had the, the uh, cysteine proteases. We had the SH, and that H got pulled off by the histidine and made an S minus, and that was a nucleophile, and that attacked the carbonyl bond. Well, here, water itself is not a nucleophile. It has to be activated, and the way it gets activated is exactly what's happening right here. This carboxyl side chain of one of the carboxyl groups is abstracting or taking this proton away from the water. That leaves a negatively charged hydroxide behind, and that negatively charged hydroxide is a nucleophile. It goes right straight for the carbonyl group, just as the other ones did, attacks it. One of the big differences between this and the serine proteases and the cysteine proteases is that this OH is not attached to anything else. It's not attached to the enzyme. In the case of the alkoxide ion, the oxygen was attached to the enzyme. In the case of the cysteine proteases, the sulfur was attached to the enzyme. This guy is just floating freely in space. So this was the example I gave you where I said this activation and this attack does not take a fast step and a slow step. The slow step in the other ones required water to come in and release that thing. This water is actually doing the whole thing right here. So basically, it's a one-step process that is breaking that peptide bond. Make sense? But activation, that's the key to your answer, the, 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 answer, the answer to your question, I should say. Connie? So it, it breaks the peptide bond by the oxygen's electrons come back and just destroy that bond itself? So uh, the oxygen here is a nucleophile, meaning it has extra electrons and it's seeking a nucleus. Mm -hmm. The nucleus is right there. That causes electronic rearrangement that breaks that peptide bond. Okay. Do we need to know like, further mechanisms? Well, I haven't shown you in class anything about that beyond the fact that it attacks that bond. If you recall, when I talked about the serine proteases, I talked about making the unstable intermediate that gets stabilized by the oxyanion hole. Mm -hmm. That's as much as I've said about the mechanism. Okay? Yes, sir? Is activation always from removing the proton? Is activation what? Uh, for all the processes I've talked about in the uh, proteases, yes, there are other ways of activating uh, molecules. But for the ones that I've talked about here, this, in, in each case, it has been removal of a proton, whether it was from a serine side chain, a cysteine side chain, in this case, um, a removal of a wa uh, from a water. Yeah. Got a good stack of note cards there, Jared? Yeah, I do. I do have a question. I'm just trying to remember all the points before I move oh, okay. I won't, I won't. I won't embarrass you. Uh, the ATC, uh, on your highlights, it says you want us to know how ATP, CTP, and aspartate yep. affect it. Okay, so how aspartate affects I was reading that okay. you say um, it starts to favor the relaxed state. It's, is that just when it's by itself? Okay. Okay, so his question is a point that I made in the highlights about 
for uh, ATCase, you should understand the effects that ATP, CTP, and aspartate have on the enzyme. Um, basically, uh, what I talked about in class uh, was that, first of all, this enzyme was a great example of allosterically regulated enzyme. And this allosterically regulated enzyme is regulated by those three uh, compounds in the cell. Okay? So when we look at the structure of um, ATCase, we discover it has 12 subunits, six regulatory and six catalytic subunits. And we describe two possible structures that the enzyme can exist in, an R or relaxed state, or a T or a tight state. And these R and T forms that we talk about here correspond exactly to the R and T we saw with hemoglobin. In the case of hemoglobin, the R state favored the binding of oxygen, the T state favored the release of oxygen. In the case of this enzyme, the R state favors the binding of substrate, which is necessary for the reaction to occur. The T state disfavors the binding of the substrate, which is necessary for the reaction to occur. Okay? Now, um, getting back to more specifically to your question, um, ATP and CTP both affect the enzyme by binding to the regulatory subunits. ATP favors the formation of the R or the relaxed state, which will favor the activation of the enzyme. CTP favors the uh, T state, which is the tight state, which disfavors the binding of substrate. Remember, again, these are not on-off switches, but up or down. And then the m more specific question you have was aspartate. How does aspartate affect it? Aspartate does not bind to the regulatory subunits. Aspartate is a substrate of the enzyme. And it also favors the formation of the R state. Okay? So uh, sufficient aspartate will flip it into the R state. It's independent of anything else that's there. Okay? It's independent of anything else that's there. It doesn't require anything else to be there to flip it into the R state. Yes? Can you go over PALA since we're on it? PALA, yeah, P-A-L-A. So P-A-L-A is another molecule I talked about relative to uh, aspartic acid. I'm sorry, relative to ATCAs. And PALA is a, um, basically a suicide inhibitor of the enzyme that looks like aspartate. It sort of looks like aspartate. The enzyme will bind it, but in the process of binding it, it becomes covalently linked to the enzyme. So PALA, as I emphasized in class, is not a natural substrate of the enzyme. It's a man-made molecule. And this man-made molecule, um, when it binds to the enzyme, will lock the enzyme in the R state. Now, that's interesting because it's covalently bound. It's locked there. Right? You say, well, if it's in the R state and it's, it's bound and it's suicide, the enzyme's not active, what does that mean? Remember that R state and T state refer to structures. right? R being the relaxed. T being the tight. So I can still talk about the R state structure even if the enzyme is dead in the water. Okay? Let's imagine the R state's relaxed, it's all nice and big. Okay? The T state, it's all compact. So if I have a poly that binds to the enzyme and flips it into the R state, the enzyme is in this big relaxed form, it just can't do anything. Okay? So I can distinguish the structure of the enzyme from the thing that the enzyme is actually doing. And it turns out that poly actually was very valuable for uh, distinguishing these R states and T states. And when we see Pala working the way that it does, it tells us, ah, now I understand why aspartate has the effect on the enzyme that it does. Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. In the insulin receptor, okay. what, what has the SH2 domain? Does IRS-1 have an SH2 domain? Okay, or? let's go to the figure, and we'll answer that directly. So you can actually see it in the figure, but I will uh, show you that. So um, let's see. Ins uh, it's right here. Okay, insulin signaling right here. Okay, so anything that's bound to a phosphotyrosine, as you see on here, has an SH2 domain. That's an SH2 domain right there because that's a phosphotyrosine. That's also a phosphotyrosine, and that's an SH2 domain right there. Your book confuses things a little bit because they talk about an SH3 domain. An SH3 domain is just another binding domain, but it doesn't bind to phosphotyrosine. It binds to something else. I'm sorry, I can't hear you.
Why is IRS1 bound to PIP2? It just happens to bind to it. And there's plenty of PIP2 here in the, in the uh, membrane. So you can think about it as an anchoring thing. You can think about it as anchoring, helping to anchor it. Yeah. Yes? In signaling? In signaling, you're talking about? Oh, okay, 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 in prothrombin. Yeah, very, that's, that's the other place I've talked about um, uh, calcium. So, yes, I'll be happy to. So, um, let's see. So I think it was right here. Uh, I'm sorry? I can't hear you. Say it again. I, I still can't hear what you're saying. Allosterium regulation? Okay, yeah. All right. So if we go to the blood clotting scheme and I talk about um, prothrombin, okay? Prothrombin, we were, okay, so let's, let's look at the big picture and then we'll come to prothrombin. So bigger picture is that we have this scheme of blood clotting that I showed, and people ask me, do I have to know what the intrinsic pathway is versus extrinsic pathway? No, I haven't talked about that in class, okay? What I focused on was everything down here, all right? And basically, these two pathways can be activated by different processes that are <coughs> happening inside of our body. Damage, bruising, cutting, whatever, okay? So these processes get activated. We have two ways of starting this cascade, and the cascade terminates down in here. So the aim of these two pathways is to, first of all, convert prothrombin to thrombin, which in turn converts fibrinogen to fibrin. Okay? Now, the relevance of prothrombin to calcium is that the, um, in order for prothrombin to be held at the site of the wound, okay? remember, we've got prothrombin floating through our bloodstream all the time. Okay? We cut ourselves. That's where we want our prothrombin to certainly be. We want it to accumulate. We want it to do its thing at that place because that's the place where we want the clot to occur. So we want to have something that kind of like the 2,3-BPG um, uh, tells the body where the uh, uh, metabolism is happening rapidly. We want to have a signal to tell the prothrombin where to go. So in order to do that, we have to modify prothrombin. Okay? So prothrombin gets modified by an enzyme that uses vitamin Okay. And that enzyme that uses vitamin K causes prothrombin to get an extra carboxyl group on it. So I'm going to come back to this figure in a second, but first I'll show you what's happening in this modification. Okay. In this modification, here is the side chain. Here's prothrombin. Here's a side chain of a glutamate. Prothrombin has several glutamates, and they can each be modified with this addition of a carboxyl group on the end of the side chain. The normal carboxyl of glutamate is just the stuff in black. The additional molecule is this guy right here. Okay? So the addition of this guy requires an enzyme that uses vitamin K. So vitamin K is going to, is called a proclotter because of this modification. We'll see the importance of this modification in just a second. Now, the addition of this second carboxyl group causes this end of prothrombin to recognize and bind to calcium. <coughs> calcium is abundant at the site of the wound. Now we've got a way of attracting and holding on to prothrombin at the site of the wound. So when we've got prothrombin at the site of the wound, the place where this conversion is going to occur is at the site of the wound. So now we've got thrombin active. To get thrombin active, we convert fibrinogen to fibrin. And fibrin, of course, is the material that makes the clot. So that activation of prothrombin is a very necessary step. If we inhibit the action of vitamin K by using a blood thinner like warfarin or something like that, then prothrombin doesn't gain a carboxyl group. Therefore, it never gets attracted to the site of the wound and our blood has a hard time clotting. Okay? So 
That's how a blood thinner works, or how one blood thinner works anyway. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Whoever answered, who asked it? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, are both hard and soft clot watertight? Are both hard and cl soft clots watertight? I never tried to blow water through one, so I don't know. Uh, I would guess that a soft clot would probably be less watertight than a hard clot would, um, but I honestly don't know the answer to your question. It's, they're fairly watertight. I mean, they're, they've got to stop that flow fairly quickly. So I would say yes, but they're not going to be as good as a hard one. How are hard clots formed again? How are hard clots formed again? So hard clots, okay, the difference between a hard clot and a soft clot, I have to show you the figure for the um, uh, polymerization. The difference between a hard clot and a soft clot is that the soft clot simply involves inserting these betas into the Bs and the alphas into the gamma sites um, on the fibrin. Okay, so we see this network of polymers that form, but these are simply quaternary interactions. They're not covalent. Remember, quaternary interactions are things that generally involve hydrogen bonds. They may involve um, uh, hydrophobic interactions and so forth. But in this case, there's nothing here that involves covalent interaction. Covalent bond formation will nail those guys together. All right. So to put these guys together, there's an enzyme called glutaminase that will covalently link the side, <coughs> excuse me, the side chains of, uh, of uh, glutamate, let's see, glutamine and, and I'm going to forget it off the top of my head, um, and lysine. I thought it was lysine. Okay put glutamine together with lysine to make a covalent bond. Now, these are happening in all kinds of places throughout this network. So it's not just here, it's not just here, but anytime these guys are in close proximity, if there's a lysine next to a glutamine, they're going to get covalently bonded together. And that covalent bonding of them together now forms the hard clot. Clear as mud? Clear as mud. Yes? Uh, uh huh? Will there be more questions on this exam than the last exam? So the question is on the format of the exam, will there be more questions on this exam than the last exam? I would say probably not. Uh, what are your thoughts? This seems to cover like a lot more material than this exam. It seems like more material than the last exam? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, do, you want more, do you want more questions? No, I mean, seriously, because if I have more questions, then each one's worth fewer points. So, I mean, I, I don't think it's a, I, I'm not asking the question to be silly. So. We still have only 50 minutes. You still have 50 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Change. Yeah. So, the, the, what I was very pleased about on the last exam was uh, it's one of the few first exams where I had very few, relatively few people saying they had too little time. And usually the first exam in 450 is the only one of the exams I give in 450 and 451 where people complain about the time. So I don't think time will be a factor for you on this exam. I hope not. Yeah. Yes? So back to things from a moment ago, I might have just missed it. OK. But does the calcium activate the prothrombin, or? Does calcium activate the prothrombin? No. OK. It's okay. just there to attract it to the, the side of the wound. And just activates itself? Or no. The, remember, those other pathways are converging okay. to activate the prothrombin. So okay. that's what's activating the prothrombin. So the conversion of the pathways activate prothrombin. That's right. It's not the calcium. Calcium doesn't activate the prothrombin, no. And keep in mind, where, when I was talking about this material in the blood clotting, we're talking about activation of zymogens. And every zymogen I've shown you is activated by breaking peptide bonds. That's what's happening all the way down that scheme. OK? Yes, Connie. Um, for the catalytic triad, how does aspartate make histidine more negative or histidine <coughs> tear that proton off of serine? Okay, so she's asking about the catalytic triad and the role of um, aspartic acid making histidine more negative is the way I described it. So uh, let me show you what happens with that. If I can pull it down here. So catalytic mechanisms and catalytic triad. Okay. So here's the catalytic triad uh, in the active site of uh, chymotrypsin, or in, as it would look in the active site of any of the serine proteases. Okay? So how is this guy over here affecting things that are happening all the way over here is basically what you're asking. 
So as I noted in class, what happens is the binding of the proper substrate, I'm having more trouble with this thing. That's too bad. I like this. There we go. Uh, the binding of the proper substrate to the enzyme causes a slight conformational change. Okay? So everything we've talked about with respect to proteins this term has been slight changes that happen. And these slight changes are very subtle. You saw in the case of hemoglobin how that very subtle uh, change caused the oxygen binding affinity to go way up or way down, depending upon which direction it went. The slight change in shape that happens here is seen in the active site. So in the case of the, of the catalytic triad, this aspartic acid is moved closer to the histidine. Aspartic acid is negatively charged. Histidine is what I like to describe as a, a sink of electrons. These electrons are resonant almost. Okay? And so you put something negatively charged on this side of the sink, what's going to happen to the electrons? Well, we're going to be much more likely to find them on this side than we are on this side. Negatives repel negatives. Okay? So when that happens, this side of the histidine becomes more, relatively more negative. That makes it much easier to pull off this positively charged proton from the side chain of serine. And that's what's happening in this process. So it's actually the proximity, the closeness of this guy that's affecting this overall uh, movement of electrons. Yeah? Sure. Let me make sure I've gotten the answer to this question. I'll come back to that. So did that answer your question okay? Okay. So, um, yeah, that experiment's an interesting one, I think. And it may be a little hard for students to understand, so it's, uh, I'm happy to, to uh, explain that to you. Um, here. Okay. So this is an enzyme known as subtle isin. Uh, somebody asked me earlier today, do I have to know subtle isin? No, it's just another example. This could be just serine protease in general. Okay. So this would be true for essentially any serine protease that we happen to exam examine. What this experiment concerned was trying to determine the relative importance of each of the members of the catalytic triad, serine, histidine, aspartic acid. So using genetic techniques, it's possible to make mutations that affect only one of those amino acids. Then you can collect that protein and see, hey, what's, how active is this protein? All right? So you start with wild-type protein, unmutated. You measure a certain KCAT. Okay, so this guy's got a pretty good KCAT over here. We see, okay, there is the KCAT for this uh, wild type protein. We get over here and we examine the first mutant protein. This is a mutant protein where the serine has been mutated to aspartic acid. We notice that in every mutation they make, the amino acid got changed to aspartic acid. So again, we're reducing number of variables. We're always making the same relative change. We're making every one into an aspartic acid. If we examine the activity of this, this enzyme, and the only mutation that's happened is we converted the serine in the active site to an aspartic acid, we see the activity go down by one, two, three, four, five, six, almost seven orders of magnitude. That's a log scale. Okay? That means that this guy right here is one ten millionth as active as this guy. All right? That tells us, A, that aspartic acid is pretty darn important. Okay? The same thing happens if we mutate a histidine to an aspartic acid. The only mutation in this enzyme is this histidine to this aspartic acid. We see it also goes down about seven orders of magnitude. The serine and the histidine play essentially equal roles in that catalytic process. Okay? If we mutate only aspartic acid, we still see a pretty good drop but we don't see a drop as deep as this. And the only point of this one is to show us that, well, aspartic acid is important. Certainly, we see a difference from here to here. That's about, what, one, two, three, four, five orders of magnitude, maybe? Maybe a 100,000-fold reduction in activity, but not as much as these guys. It says that aspartic acid isn't as critical in that process or in that catalytic action as these two are. Now, we look at over here and we say, OK, here's uh, the mutation of all three of these. How come it's not even any lower than this? And the answer is that these guys, any one of these is deadly, essentially, as far as the enzyme is concerned. It doesn't take it all the way down to the uncatalyzed. And why did I say that happens in, in class? Anybody remember? 
What else are factors in this catalytic process? I mean, the overall structure. Is the structure. overall structure of the enzyme is still pretty much there. So that tells us that there's something in the structure that's still playing a bit of a role in that catalytic process. We're not destroying the structure of the enzyme in doing this. Okay? But essentially, this, these are all pretty much dead in the water. This is one ten millionth of the activity of the wild type. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess I just thought it would be a little bit more because um, the theory is the same. Well, it may, in fact, be a little bit lower. Okay? So you know, it's a little hard to look on a bar graph like that and see. Remember, we're looking at a log scale. So a little bit lower is, I mean, would be hard to see on there. Okay. We're not going to see seven orders of magnitude again, no. <coughs> Neil? I'm saying this, this tells us that serine and histidine have equal roles. Okay. Right? Either one knocks it down as low as, as the other one, as, the whole, as all three do. Yes, Elliot. In this case, each one is being changed to alanine. But keep in mind, this is one enzyme, this is a different enzyme, this is a different enzyme. So only in this enzyme do we change all of them to alanine. OK? Yes? Epidermal growth factor, OK? Okay, let me pull let me pull that up before I uh, get going to your question. So, epidermal growth factor, uh, right here, and EGF is, yep, wrong one. I do that every time. How about no? How about where did I do that? Um, is it here? No. Well, now, come on. Not there. It's going to be the last one I'll get. Ta-da. All right. OK, back to your question. So um, the S-Risk is that like, is that like the GLP-2 amyrastor that won't get blocked and that will come towards the phosphorylated section? I'm sorry, the SOS is that what you're talking about? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. Are you asking if this is coming in as a, as a group into this? Yeah, is it coming in as one big group? Or does GRP2 yeah. first, then SOS? Uh, I, I can't answer that question. I, I don't know the, the order. Okay. I, it would be safe to assume for our purposes it's sequential. But I mean, it's possible that you may get two coming in at once. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. OK, uh, so the question is that the, uh, the dimerization of this, how does this favor the activation of the uh, tyrosine kinase activity, I think is what you're asking, right? OK, so this is very much like what we saw in the case of the insulin receptor. The only difference was in the insulin receptor, it started out as a dimer, and the two, the two um, ends were basically stuck in each other's active site blocking them. The slight shape change allowed one of them to get a little bit further out and get, get phosphorylated. It's a very similar mechanism that's happening here. When these two guys come together, this guy's face gets stuck in over here and it gets phosphorylated, which in turn causes it to now start phosphorylating this. And so it's very similar to what's happening with the, ep with the insulin receptor, one activating the other, and then multiple phosphorylations happening as a result of that. OK? okay. Yeah, OK, so it's a, it, it, as you can imagine, there's a lot of complexity in here, right? So his question is, if, uh, how can I explain how this binding of this thing causes this thing to change shape, which causes this thing to uh, dump its GDP and get to GTP? It's really, you know, I mean, it's a schematic diagram is what it is. It's not unlike the schematic diagram we used to show the activation of the GDP with the epi epi um, adrenergic receptor, right? I mean, I showed you the sort of black box, and I said, then this dumps a GDP and, and puts a GTP in there. The same thing is happening here. That, that's really beyond what we can, we can cover here. So, yeah. But it is, all these things are happening as a result of these slight shape, shape changes. And that's the theme we come back to over and over and over. Slight changes in the shape of the protein really affect that. Yeah. Um, other than the 
Um, so uh, her question is, other than, she said, other than the, uh, the dimerization, is there any significance to the fact that the two EGFs have to bind? Well, the significance is it takes, these don't exist as a dimer in the cell. So obviously, in order to make that dimer, we have to have two, EGF, uh, two EGFs bind, one to each one. Yeah. Yeah. Her question has to do with if concentration matters, and it turns out it's actually a very good question. Um, since you've asked it, I'll, I'll very briefly tell you a story. I don't. I use. In fact, your book doesn't cover it this time, which is why I didn't go into it. But there's a related receptor. You're not responsible for this, so I'll just tell you. But it's kind of a cool story. There's a related receptor uh, that's very similar to the epidermal growth factor receptor called HER, H-E-R, and it resembles uh, this uh, EGF. And in fact, it resembles it enough that her can bind to EGF without needing epidermal growth factor. Okay? So normally in the cell, probably at a low rate, her occasionally binds to EGF, it stimulates the response, and the cell divides, and everybody's fine and happy. Okay? Mutation of the promoter of her causes her to be overproduced in some cells. Okay? So when this happens, you've got way too much HER, and HER goes around grabbing all the epidermal growth factors and starts stimulating all of them, and it starts stimulating cells to divide uncontrollably. So this is an example of an oncogene. HER is an oncogene that will cause that to happen. Okay, so we're just making too much HER. It's kind of like when we made too much BCR able. We're making too much HER, and the, the cell is stimulated to divide. Well, it turns out HER is commonly stimulated to divide in breast cancer. Okay, and there is a uh, a very interesting and a very good treatment for her related tumors, and there's a a, a monoclonal antibody called Herceptin, that is targeted specifically to bind to her, and prevent that stimulation from happening. Herceptin is a very very effective anti-cancer drug. It has very very few side effects. Um, and if for her related tumors, it's very effective at knocking it down and, in fact, knocking it out. Um, and that actually relates directly to what you're asking about, which is concentration. Concentration of these could be a factor. So if we had too much epidermal growth factor, for example, we would probably have a similar problem. <laughs> okay? Uh, let's see, Neil. Well, but the e EGF normally does not exist as a dimer. Oh, okay. When it doesn't bind to EGF, e it's, it's a monomer. It's floating around in the membrane, not bound to the other one. That's the thing I talked about. When this guy binds to EGF, this little loop flips out. And so if it doesn't bind EGF, then there's no loop and there's nothing to, 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 to basically attract it to the other one. Do you call it an induced dimer? I'm sorry? Do you call it an induced dimer? Okay. <laughs> I call it Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. It's just like we saw in the beta adrenergic reception when we had the G protein that dropped okay. the GDP and replaced it with GTP. Okay. Exactly the same okay. thing is happening. And that's why it's showing you GTP is going in and GDP is going out. Okay. So we're not putting a phosphate on there. We're actually kicking out the GDP okay. and putting a GTP in there. Okay? Connie. How come it's on the G protein? It's a G-like protein. So it's, it's different enough from a, a G protein. We don't call it a G protein, but we do call it a G-like protein. Okay. It's just no. It's just nomenclature. Yeah. Yeah, Liz. Do proteins always have those three units, like the alpha unit, the beta unit, and the gamma unit? Yeah, Liz's question has to do with G proteins having an alpha, beta, and gamma subunit. And as far as I know, they, they do have all three. And this, this one, as you notice, RAS doesn't have the other two, so it's why we call it a G-like protein. So this would be more like the alpha unit that we saw on the G protein. Other questions? Yes? Can you explain the uh, restriction modification system again? Certainly, restriction modification systems. So um, I think restriction modification systems are pretty cool, pretty interesting stuff. Um, I talked about them relative to uh, uh, catalytic mechanisms. And um, they um, are. Uh, most of what I had to say about the, the enzymes themselves were more the importance of them relative to bacteria than about mechanism. I'm going to very briefly talk about mechanism 
but I think they're most interesting from the perspective of what they do. Okay? So it was related to the mechanism that I talked about this because when I talked about mechanisms of actions of enzymes, I pointed out to the need to activate various things. We saw in the case of the proteases, we had to activate hydroxyls or serines or waters, and those activated nucleophiles then attacked specific, in the case of protein, uh, carbonyl groups and caused peptide bonds to break. In the case of restriction enzymes, we also see activation. We have activation of water again, okay? And that activated hydroxyl that arises attacks a phosphodiester bond. It's not attacking a peptide bond. But the phosphodiester bond is the bond that's between adjacent nucleotides in DNA. So a restriction enzyme has a catalytic site that favors the activation of water to break phosphodiester bonds. And restriction enzymes themselves have the ability to recognize specific nucleotide sequences in DNA just the same way that a protease has the ability to recognize specific sequences of amino acids in a protein. Okay? So in the case of the restriction enzyme, what's happening is when the restriction enzyme finds the proper sequence, it changes shape, and that change of shape causes the DNA that it's holding on to to bend. And the bending of that DNA allows a nice little pocket for magnesium and water to be located for water to be activated by the enzyme. So that's the activation part of that process. All right? Now, to answer the, the, the bigger question about restriction enzymes relative to bacteria, restriction enzymes are important uh, as a protective mechanism for bacteria against invasion of viruses known as bacteriophages. Okay? So restriction enzymes are always paired in a, in a cell with what's called a methylase. So they're called restriction modification systems. The restriction part is the restriction enzyme. The modification part is the methylase. And so what a methylase does is it recognizes exactly the same sequence as the restriction enzyme does, but instead of cutting it, it favors the addition of a methyl group at a specific place in that site. And what that single methyl group does is it prevents the restriction enzyme from recognizing that. Therefore, it doesn't bend it. It doesn't allow that site to be cut. So the modification system is there to protect the cellular DNA from destruction by the restriction enzyme. And the restriction enzyme is there to attack invading viral DNA. As I noticed, noted in class, it's not a perfect system. Okay? It's not a perfect system because, yes, sometimes a virus will get methylated first before the restriction enzyme gets there. You can imagine situations where the restriction enzyme might occasionally cut the, the bacterial DNA, and that can happen too. But the system is better than no protection at all. That's what we see throughout biology. Okay, yeah? So does this mean the modification is going in front of the restriction? So, the so his question is, 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 the restriction, is the modification going in front of the restriction? The, res the modification is on a separate enzyme. So it's a chance thing. Okay. It's really a chance thing. Yeah. Connie. Does each like, bacteria have their own specific restriction enzyme? Good question. So her question was, does each bacterium have its own specific uh, restriction enzymes? Um, we, will, we see a lot of variation in restriction enzymes from one bacterium to another. Within a given species, we see limited numbers. So in the case of the one I showed you in class, that was E. coli 5. That one's found in E. coli. And in E. coli, Across all of E. coli, we find maybe three or four or five restriction enzymes. But if I went to something like Salmonella or I went to um, Pseudomonas or something like that, I would find restriction enzymes that recognize different things. But if like, I just isolated one um, e. E. Coli. e. coli bacterium, yeah. would it yeah. just have one restriction okay, enzyme? Okay, so the question is if I, if I isolated an e., uh, an e. coli bacterium but it only have one enzyme in it, it might have as many as two or three. Yeah. So it could have several within a given bacterium. Yeah. Okay? But it's a small number. It's not a, not a, not a giant number. Okay. Yeah. Are Jared? Restriction enzymes only on the DNA, or will they be out in the cytoplasm? Okay. Sometimes get viral DNA. Okay. So his question is, um, basically, are, where are restriction enzymes located? So remember that we don't have a nucleus in bacteria. Okay. So the DNA is in the cytoplasm all the time. And, um, but I think more specifically, your question is, is the restriction enzyme found only on the DNA? And the answer is no, it's not. It's soluble in the cytoplasm, and it's floating all around, which is how, and that's important, 
because we don't want it just sitting there on the cellular DNA because if it were, when a virus comes in, the restriction enzyme would never see it if it were staying only with the DNA. Connie. Uh, for feedback inhibition, can you still call it that if, it, if the end product doesn't knock out the first uh, pathway, but like the second or third? Okay, so really Connie's thing. asking me a semantic question here. So her question is, if I, I describe feedback inhibition as the end product of a pathway inhibiting the first enzyme in the pathway, what if it knocks out the second enzyme in the pathway? Well, it's really a semantic argument. So uh, the answer is, in a sense, I suppose it is. Because remember, pathways, what we define as a pathway is random. Okay. okay? So um, I'm not going to split hairs like that. Okay. Yeah. Because again, what's the last molecule in a pathway? That's also random, what I define as that, right? Yes, sir? Yes. Okay. Okay, so his question has to do with anabolic and catabolic electron carriers. That's not something I talked about yet in class, but since you've asked the question, I will, I will answer it for you. So catabolic processes, of course, we remember are breaking down of large molecules into smaller molecules. Anabolic processes take small molecules and build them into larger molecules. So cells get energy by catabolism. They use that energy in anabolism, making things that they want. Okay? So catabolic processes, the one you've seen so far, is glycolysis. All right? We'll talk later in the term about glycogen breakdown. Okay? We'll talk next term about the citric acid cycle. We'll talk about fatty acid breakdown. And all of these are catabolic processes, larger molecules being broken into smaller ones. And when that happens, there's frequently oxidation that has to occur. Okay? Oxidation, you recall, involves the loss of electrons. And loss of electrons, when those electrons are lost, as I said, they don't just disappear into thin air. Something's got to happen to them, and cells use electron carriers. There are two electron carriers we commonly see in catabolic processes. NAD and FAD both accept electrons commonly in catabolic processes. Okay? In anabolic processes, that is making things, like in the, most, the best example I can give you is in making fatty acids that we'll talk about next term, we see a different electron carrier that is used primarily, not exclusively, but primarily in uh, anabolic processes, and this is NADPH. So that's where we see NADP versus NADPH. The NADP uh, <coughs> carriers tend to be more involved in, in anabolic processes. The NAD and FAD carriers more involved in catabolic processes. So that's, that's what they're referring to. Okay? Yes? Can define Yeah. Could I define allosteria? I'm glad that you asked. So allosteria is the, um, when a small molecule binds to a protein. Actually, I did define it in class as an enzyme, where a small molecule binds to an enzyme and affects the enzyme's activity. That effect can be positive. That effect can be negative. Depends on the molecule. Depends on the enzyme. Okay? Connie. A follow-up to that question, um, does allosteria ever tell you where it binds on the enzyme? Like a regulatory subunit or the active site or like type? Okay, so Connie's question is actually a complicated one. Uh, it is, does allosteria ever tell us where it binds? The answer is just by the kinetic data itself, we don't really get that much information out of it, no. We need other structural changes and other structural information to know, are there regulatory subunits? Are, there, are they separate from catalytic subunits? And that's a more involved process. Yes? What's the first messenger in the angiotensin system? Angiotensin. Yep. Uh, and, and you're not responsible for that. I just gave that as an example. So I just showed you that phospholipase C pathway saying we've got this going through here. And I give angiotensin as an example of a type of pathway that does that. But I didn't talk specifically about the first messenger in that. Yes? The synthesis of the N-linked glycoprotein, certainly. So uh, let's go to carbohydrates. And um, OK. So um, 
when we go to synthesize N-length glycoproteins, first of all, N-length glycoproteins, their synthesis starts in the endoplasmic reticulum. And in the endoplasmic reticulum, some of the common things are added that you see on the screen here. So all N-length glycoproteins will have a common core of five modified sugar residues. Okay? I'm not asking you to know which ones are there, but you should know that there's a common core that's there. I talked about how the synthesis of N-length glycoproteins starts. Okay, and I'll talk, about, talk to you about that in a second. N-length glycoproteins, their synthesis starts in the endoplasmic reticulum, but it's completed in the Golgi apparatus. Okay? So um, N-length are, 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 are made in both places, in essence. The O-length glycoproteins are made only in the Golgi apparatus. Now, to answer your question, I think, which is how do these guys get made, and uh, that's not what I wanted. Dolichophosphate. Okay. I talked in class about the role of this molecule in the initial synthesis of that carbohydrate Christmas tree on glycoproteins. I talked about how that how that's made. So dolichophosphate is a molecule that plays an important role in that process. Dolichophosphate is a membrane lipid. It's found in the membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum. And to start, it looks like this. So we can think of the lipid bilayer. This nonpolar portion is stuck in the lipid bilayer. And this phosphate is sticking out because the lipid bilayer on the inner portion is very nonpolar. This guy doesn't fit very well. So this is sticking out into the cytoplasm. Okay? The phosphate sticking out into the cytoplasm. And when we go to make an N-length glycoprotein, we've got to start making that core, and we start making it on here. So there are enzymes that start putting those phosphates on this phosphate sticking out in the cytoplasm. And then, that's why I talked about magic, okay? And then something magical happens, and this molecule inverts. So the thing that was on the phosphate on the outside flips and now becomes on the inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. It's crossing that lipid bilayer and doing this and carrying with it those modified sugar residues on there that will ultimately get put onto that N-length glycoprotein. All right? Once it gets inside, additional residues may be added, and then it will be that, that beginning of the Christmas tree will be transferred to a target protein, making a glycoprotein. Yes? I'm sorry if you've already said this, but um, the ones that are added to it prior to it flipping, is it just the five um, core? Uh, I haven't specifically said okay. that. I said we, we start with the five. Okay. okay. So um, I, uh, it doesn't matter for our purposes okay. if there's three or four or six, but the important thing is that the process is starting in the, out there in the cytoplasm. Okay. 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 Um, so anyway, once it gets inside, once that flip has happened, then, as I say, additional residues may be added to that, and then it'll be transferred off of this phosphate back on, or onto the target protein, and then this guy will turn around and flip back out and be ready to do another one. I forget who asked me the question. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so it, it ends up flipping it out to the other side? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then it just goes to the goals. So, well, the, the protein goes to the goals. Remember, this, this molecule is, is stuck in the membrane. This, this is not attached to the protein. Yeah. So this is in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. Well, as I said in class, um, you're only responsible for what I talk about in class. So I haven't talked about that in class. You're talking about uh, this guy here, right? Yeah. I like ARF. It's my favorite. Yes, sir? About what? Yes. Okay, so his question has to do with the three, three different pathways that can happen after pyruvate. 
And how much detail do I want you to know? Whatever I said in class. Yeah. Yes? Does protein kinase A phosphorylate phosphodiesterase? Does protein kinase A phosphorylate phosphodiesterase? No. No. OK. So let me, let me answer your, your, your question a little bit. So you're wondering how phosphodiesterase itself is, is controlled, basically. OK. So phosphodiesterase, uh, just to remind everybody, phosphodiesterase is an enzyme that breaks down cyclic AMP. It converts cyclic AMP to AMP. And when it's converted to AMP, it no longer behaves like cyclic AMP. It can't affect protein kinase A anymore at all. Okay? So it's generally on. So more importantly, we're concerned with pro phosphodiesterase. How do we turn it off? Okay? And that's where caffeine comes in. Caffeine is an allosteric inhibitor of phosphodiesterase and stops the enzyme from breaking down cyclic AMP. So when the enzyme stops breaking down cyclic AMP, cellular concentrations of cyclic AMP increase, and that then favors that cascade that ultimately breaks down glycogen to make glucose. Does that? Yeah. But, but the, no, it does not phosphorylate that, no. Connie? Um, what's the difference between suicide inhibition and competitive inhibition besides the covalent bonding? Is there anything? What's the difference between suicide inhibition and competitive inhibition besides the covalent bonding? None. All right, so you guys are getting a little, like you're a little worn out here. What do you say we call it an evening? I will be available. My schedule, as I've noted, is lightening up this week, so I should be around. If you have questions, please feel free to come by and see me. Um, I probably will announce in class tomorrow uh, that I will allow you to suggest a question for the exam. So if you want to send me and email me a question for consideration for the exam, I will use one submit student submitted question for the exam. Released, just like any other product of an enzyme would be released. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Certainly. I haven't even thought about it. Yep. So, but for now, we have one extra question. You know, for sure, right? Uh, if I decide you guys sang loudly enough, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, have to, I have to go back and look at the tapes and see. It was pretty loud. Yeah, it was pretty loud. Certainly. Take care.